Welcome back to the Chad AC Show News Talk KFYO. Since we didn't get to visit with him yesterday, we get to uh, visit with our friend over at uh, quorumreport.com, editor of quorumreport.com. It's Scott Braddock. Scott, good morning. How are you today? Doing well. Happy to join whatever day is convenient. I know you had the big mayoral debate yesterday, right? I didn't get to hear it. Did that get heated? It uh, it got a little uh, the uh, uh, chippy. Uh, well, that, that's the word that was sent to me. Uh, chippy yeah, at times. I, I've got to drive to uh, Dallas Fort Worth from Austin later today. Maybe I'll, I'll bring up the YouTube and listen to it. There you go. You should. It uh, it, it did get a little chippy uh, mm-hmm. at times uh, for sure. Uh, we've there, there's a lot of Texas politics uh, going oh. on, and of course we're now. 14 days away from the election, and uh, we've got more money pouring into the state, it looks like. No question. Uh, Democrats have money. How many times do we report this here on the show? And that's just such a big shift from previously in legislative races. Um, a couple of things. One, the candidates have so much money. We reported uh, you know, on the 30-day report uh, that you had uh, candidates uh, this time around for the Texas House who are Democrats who were outraising multiple uh, Republicans around the state and just two of the Democratic candidates this time around. Uh, their fundraising totals were, uh, you know, if you put them together, were bigger than all of the fundraising totals for all 12 of those Texas Democratic uh, candidates who flipped seats back in 2018. So a lot of money pouring in for them. And then just this morning we see that this super PAC, and it's a weird sentence to type out, Chad, we're not used to saying something like this, a Democratic uh, national super PAC spending over $12 million now to try to support those Democratic candidates. That's a doubling of what they were doing before. They had announced about $6.2 million from this group called Forward Majority. Uh, and I have been all over the state at this point. Uh, usually, Chad, I put thousands of miles on my truck by now at this point in the election cycle. I'm having to do an abbreviated version of that because of COVID and you know there haven't been as many uh, political events, those sorts of things to go cover. But I've wanted to see what's going on on the ground in these different races, and so I've concentrated a lot in um, Dallas-Fort Worth, where I'm headed to again today, uh, and then down in the Houston area. And you see the evidence in those districts of this spending. Um, there were multiple mail pieces, um, you know, the, the big glossy pieces that show up in people's mailboxes. Um, there were at least uh, nine of them uh, per swing seat that are being sent into these districts, nine negative pieces against Texas House Republicans. Um, And that's in addition to whatever those Democratic candidates are doing. We haven't seen a flood of uh, mail and television as well to support Democrats like we're seeing right now. And as you know, Democrats are only nine seats away from winning the majority in the Texas House with the prize of redistricting. Uh, That's what's on their minds, Chad, because we've got that coming up in 2021. And they want a seat at the table. I think that's the way to say it, because Republicans would still largely control the redistricting process, uh, even if the Democrats control the majority in the Texas House, but a majority there, and to have a Democrat holding the gavel uh, at the front of the legislative chamber, that would give them a seat at the table, uh, you know, as far as trying to draw those political maps, which does then set the table for power over the next decade in this state. Yeah, and I was going to ask you, even if, if Democrats don't take all nine seats, I mean, that would that'd be yeah. something if they were able to take all nine mm-hmm. seats. But let's say they were able to take five or, or six yeah. of those seats. Um, that would, I mean, that that would give them a seat at the table, would it not? It sure does. Uh, yesterday, we uh, have you know, put up a report at quorumreport.com about what I called the first symptoms of a speaker's race. Um, you know, we have had one candidate uh, say that uh, he's not going to be a candidate, a past candidate for Price from Amarillo, uh, told us yesterday that he's not going to run for speaker. And somebody immediately pointed out, they said, didn't Dennis Bonin at one point say he was never going to run for speaker? <laughs> I think it's a little different. I, I don't think Four Price is doing the same kind of head fake that Bonin was doing. Well, he's been uh, long rumored to be somebody who would be in line, if you absolutely. will. Absolutely, mm-hmm. and that's why it. Uh, I think that's why it was uh, maybe not the biggest news ever, but certainly significant news yeah. for him to take his name uh, out of the running. Uh, you know, interesting, and it, it came to light. You know, in conversations uh, with various uh, members uh, of the Texas House, that they are starting to have their own conversations, not necessarily about who should be the speaker specifically. They're not really talking, as far as I can tell, Chad, not really talking about specific names of who they would support just yet. But this conversation is going to hit warp speed uh, after Election Day, which is you know just coming up in about two weeks here. Um, right now it's sort of a murmur 
it's sort of um, a, a low hum, if you will, about you know what kind of person they want to see as speaker. Uh, but as soon as they know what the makeup of the chamber is going to be, if the Democrats are going to take the House majority, or if Republicans are going to you know retain the majority, uh, or as you say, if there's a very uh, slim majority uh, for Republicans, if because you know Democrats pick up some seats but they don't quite get there all the way, uh, that'll change the math. That'll change the kind of conversations that are having that they're having uh, amongst themselves. I think one thing that people get wrong about this, and this is just my observation, and you know having a front row seat for all this stuff in Austin over the years, is that people who are outsiders, and I'm including myself in that chat, anybody who's not a member of the House. We all tend to kind of overthink this conversation. But people want to think about what part of the state is the person from? Are they more conservative or more liberal? Um, you know, how much Democratic versus Republican support can that person get? Instead, it's it's a very personal decision. There are only 150 members who get to vote on this, and they basically all know each other. And so, because it's an interpersonal kind of thing, it has more to do with who they trust to be the leader of the House. I think when Bonin went in there. The argument for him was, you know, they knew him to be somebody who was a fighter, somebody who would literally, you know, scream to make his case. Uh, and in the past, it said that he would not be bullied by, and the House would not be bullied by Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, for example. Um, I think that there was some immediate buyer's remorse on, you know, on that count because uh, members thought that Bonin was going to really, you know, be an independent voice for the House and and really take the governor to task or the lieutenant governor to task when necessary. Not always, because these are all Republicans, but sometimes they don't agree, of course. Um, uh, but I think the members felt burned, because, not just because of the conversation with Empower Texans, but because Bonin was pretty much on the Governor Abbott team the whole way through, was working hand-in-hand hand with him, uh, when I think the members would have liked to see something where uh, there was more of an independent kind of person in that role. So I think that's the kind of conversation they're starting to have now. And it looks like as soon as this weekend, uh, some Texas House Republicans are going to get together and uh, start to really have uh, conversations about this in earnest. Hmm. Uh, when it comes to early voting, we're seeing record turnout hmm. across the state. Uh, here in Lubbock, uh, down in, in, in Houston, over in Dallas, Austin, we're seeing record turnout all over the place. Uh, what do you think it means right now? Four million people so far have cast their votes in Texas of course, I see uh, conservatives online saying, oh, well, there's the proof of the voter suppression that the Democrats are always talking about. The fact that everybody's uh, able to get out there and vote, uh, you know, sort of uh, counters that narrative. Uh, I would say on that count that it, you can have a certain level of voter suppression attempted at least going on. Uh, and then in other places, um, you know, it's not as prevalent. Uh, there is some evidence that investing in voting infrastructure, particularly in Harris County, which is the most populous county, that that investment has paid off. I think they spent, Chad, down there $30 million or so dollars to try to expand wow. access to voting in the Houston area, and it's paid off. Look, I mean, they've had, um, you know, multiple days in a row of 100,000 people each day voting uh, in Harris County. So and one, of the, one of the folks that um, I trust on these sorts of numbers was saying that if the Democrats ever get to 60% or so, uh, you know, outvoting Republicans, 60-40 in Harris County, uh, then that has serious implications for the statewide numbers uh, in some of these races, like the race for president, the U.S. Senate race, um, railroad commission, et cetera. So we'll keep a close eye on that. Here's the question. Is it a case where we're going to see more voters overall than we have seen in the past, or are people just voting now? Uh, you know, is it, is it front-loaded? Is it Democrats just voting now because they're ready to do that, and then Republicans show up toward the end of early voting, uh, and on Election Day itself. You know, there's a lot of conservatives, Chad, who argue that we shouldn't even have early voting. Uh, when uh, Alan West sued the governor over expanding early voting, the argument, he was part of the lawsuit, it was Alan West and Agriculture Commissioner Sid Miller and others uh, who were saying that the governor was overstepping his authority by doing that. Underlying that is the sort of um, sentiment from some conservatives that, you know, they say that Election Day is the only day you should vote. Uh, and not on, uh, you know, not not all this early voting. There, there are some who think it's a scam or or whatever. I, I don't know that you subscribe to that, but um, I think that you will. Well, I voted yesterday, public. so <laughs> yeah, right. I saw your sticker. Yeah, yeah. I saw your sticker. Yeah, I you voted yesterday, so I guess and, I'm part of it. Yeah, well, there's, I mean, there's um, there's disagreement about it, right? So yeah. it, it's just, uh, it's interesting. I had heard about some uh, internal polling among Republicans. Uh, who had said that uh, what their numbers were showing were that uh, GOP voters were more likely, much more likely to vote closer to Election Day or on Election Day. I think only 
uh, about 36 to 40 percent were, but were planning to vote early. That's what they told hmm. pollsters. So, so we'll see if that bears out. But, uh, but look, we have had exponential growth in not only the number of registered voters, which is you know approaching 17 million people in Texas, um, but we've also seen actual voting increase. In 2014, um, you know, two midterms ago, it was about four million people who voted. In 2018, that number doubled to 8.4 million. Uh, what does that mean for voting this year? Um, it, you know, it does it mean that we hit 11 million voters, 12 million voters? Uh, I think at the pace that we're going now, it would not be unreasonable to say that anybody who wins a statewide race, whether it's Senator Cornyn, President Trump, uh, you know, whoever's running for railroad commissioner, uh, you know, on the Democratic or Republican side, any of those folks who are running statewide, they may have to get in excess of 5.5 million or 6 million votes to be a majority of uh, around 12 million votes. Hmm. Uh, Huge numbers. Before I let you go, uh, a race, and you and I didn't talk about this beforehand, so uh, sorry to put you on the spot if I am. I'll do my Uh, best. What's going on in the the race with uh, Chip Roy and Wendy Davis? It's been a nasty back and forth uh, between the two. Uh, there's a lot of third-party spending. I actually live um, in the next uh, congressional district to uh, the north, or one of the next ones to the north, which is uh, the district that Michael McCall represents uh, okay. here in uh, Austin. Uh, but I'm seeing a lot of the advertisements in that, and you do have, uh, you know, uh, Chip Roy being attacked, uh, you know, for not being, uh, you know, sufficiently supportive of military. Uh, you have uh, Wendy Davis, of course, being attacked as, uh, you know, by some as the abortion Barbie, quote unquote. People were calling her that, uh, you know, for the filibuster when she was a state senator back in 2013. Um, it is going to be a close race. Uh, you can see that it's one of those races where um, the the Republican who represents a lot of suburban area, because that district runs from uh, South Austin down to the San Antonio area, and then the most conservative part of it is over in uh, the Hill Country in in the Kerrville area, Kerr County, uh, in that part of the state. Um, There are plenty of votes there for the Republican, for Chip Roy, but in the advertisements, Chad, and I see this in suburban districts all over the state, the Republican isn't calling himself necessarily a Republican or branding himself that way or talking about himself as a conservative. Instead, the message from the Republican is that he's an effective uh, legislator, somebody who's willing to work with uh, Democrats when it makes sense and call out his own party when it makes sense. And that's something that may resonate, but it's certainly a shift. And you see the same thing from Michael McCall. You see the same thing from uh, Wesley Hunt, who's a Republican running, challenging a Democrat uh, for Congress in Houston. And elsewhere, uh, Dan Crenshaw, who's running for Congress in uh, the Houston area, also sort of backing away from you know being uh, someone who's branded as Republican. You, you saw that uh, that movie trailer that uh, Dan Crenshaw put out? Yeah. Uh, the, the, <laughs> the Texas Reloaded, he called it, I think, the greatest joint political ad for congressional candidates in history or something like that. It was sort of tongue-in-cheek and kind of fun. But one thing that they never said about any of the candidates in that ad is that they're Republicans. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, Interesting yeah, shift. It, you, never, you wouldn't have seen that four years ago. Yeah. Right? All of the campaign signs and the commercials would all say, you know, that they're Republicans, uh, conservative Republicans. And they don't talk much either about being um you know, partners with President Trump. Uh, I think right now the Republican brand, um, in at least in the suburbs, is seen as Trump, and that's not helping them there. It, 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 they face serious headwinds in those areas. Well, and that's something that Crenshaw has spoken about as well, um, yeah. and, and and Dennis Bonnet on the secretly recorded audio. So, yeah. I mean, that's 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 been out there. Uh, Scott, tell folks what you're covering over at quorumreport.com. Well, we will have uh, some in-depth reports on these races that are happening around the state. Where exactly are these Democrats putting money uh, into these races? Uh, and what's happening with all that? You can find out uh, in real time. Uh, and We also have the latest happening with your state government. They put together uh, a plan for distribution of coronavirus vaccine if and when it's widely available. All of that for you at quorumreport.com. Just click on subscriptions, and we'll get you signed up. Very good. Scott, as always, appreciate your time, and we'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Chad. Thank you. That's Scott Braddock, editor, quorumreport.com.